Hello. Um, it's the moment you've all been waiting for. We're going to talk about the muscular system and take some notes about this amazing part of our human body. Um, some things we get to learn about, um, how we work out, how we move, how we relax. What we probably won't cover is going to be the muscles that you might eat at like a seafood boil. Um, still good, just not really what we are going to talk about today. Um, if we are looking at splitting this up in like four different sections, we are going to look at some types of muscles. We are going to look at the anatomy of muscles, like what makes them up. We're going to see how muscles contract. How do we move? Um, and then like any factors that impact our muscle movement, um, outside of that, how we respond to things. If you are using Avid Notes, um, there's a little section for you to write your essential question, um, as there always is, lucky you. Um, big thing for the essential question, right? We're always trying to think about like, how does the structure and function of this system? So like, how is it built? What does it do? And how do those things help us do stuff like create movement, um, have our bodily functions? And then the thing we are really gonna look at we are really taking a deeper dive on like what is specifically skeletal muscle and how does that help us out in voluntary actions? How does it help us out in maintaining our posture? And finally, that word we all are going to grow to love, homeostasis, or how does it help us like balance our body, right? So we're all about that balance. Um, to start us off, we're going to look at types of muscles um, and kind of give an overview of like what what's what's a muscle doing, um, and then specifically what are these three types of muscle doing: the smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, and skeletal muscles. So if we're looking at just muscles in general, um, some some cool facts about muscles. I think we've got over 600 distinct skeletal muscles in our human body. That's a lot of muscles and they're working every day to make sure we're doing things we need to do. Um, if you just start thinking about your, your cute little face, um, you've got 60 muscles just in your face. 40 of them, um, are used to do frowning, um, type actions, right? So, anything related to frowning. Um, 20 of them are used to smile. So, you know, maybe it's less effort to smile than it is to frown. Although that also depends on the size of the muscle and how many fibers it has too. So, um, but we won't get into that debate. Um, the smallest muscle in our body is the stapedius muscle. It is in our ear. Um, so cute. Uh, it helps us, you know, detect vibrations that are happening in the world so we can hear things around us. Um, the largest muscle is everybody's fave, the gluteus maximus, or the butt. Um, helps us do all sorts of things from moving to being stable, like being able to, like, stand up straight. Um, all that good stuff. Also, like, protects our, our bones. The larger the muscle, the more protection you've got, which is nice. Um, and then our longest muscle in our body is the sartorius. It's in the thigh. Um, it's very flexible um, and it's very long. All skeletal muscles are built from the same tissue. So all these muscles we are talking about here, they really have like the same building blocks. So all of all the ones we're gonna like take a look at in terms of skeletal muscle, those building blocks, are the same. So I'm just going to write building blocks there because as we take a look at other examples, we want to keep in mind, like, we, I might talk about the bicep, um, but a lot of components of the bicep is very similar to the gluteus maximus. Um, all right, our muscles are organs. Um, so they are an entire system of organs. They help us generate movement or they help us get up and move around. They also help us generate heat so they keep us warm. A lot of the stuff we do um, with our muscular system generates heat, which is nice for maintaining that balance. So if we're already thinking about like maybe some homeostasis connections, homeostasis is going to connect to that one there, heat. Um, they also help us in getting where we need to go, like walking around. They help us speak. These muscles are also around helping us breathe. They're pumping blood through our body 
and even moving food through our digestive system. So muscles, they're doing all sorts of things. Um, three types of muscles that we're gonna like take a peek at. Um, skeletal muscles, we will deep dive on those. Um, these are voluntary, which means you control what they get to do. Um, so if you're saying, hey, Ms. Watermelon, I'm going to raise my hand and ask you a question, you're volunteering to make that muscle move. Um, smooth muscles, we're going to look at as well. They are not voluntary. They're involuntary. You don't have a say in what they do. Same with cardiac muscles. Um, and if you're somebody, you're noticing that you might, this word seems a little familiar, it kind of sounds like heart. Maybe you're having some ideas about what those muscles could be. Hey, I love that for you. Way to go. All right, the first muscles we want to look at here are some smooth muscles. Um, I love remembering these because they actually look smooth, right? If we're looking at this um, diagram up top here, which is like a little illustration, they are, they're like a nice smooth shape, right? They're a little larger in the middle. They like taper off at the end. They fit really nicely together. There's not a lot of space between them then. And you can see that right in this like microscopic drawing, right? There's no real spaces between this. They all kind of blend together really well. This muscle group is not very strong in terms of like how much force they can lift. So LOL losers, um, but they do maintain contraction a lot longer. These are contracting around a lot of organs um, that are constantly functioning for us. So they have to be working a lot longer, um, but maybe just not lifting the same types of heavy material. Um, these we do not control. So you do not have to think about digestion. Um, as soon as you're done chewing your food, right, you don't have to think about how it's passing through the rest of your body. You don't have to think about how um, your blood vessels can like um, increase in diameter and decrease in diameter. You don't have to control that. It is involuntary. So you're not in control. Or at least your brain it doesn't have to think it, not in your thoughts, not in your brain. Um, these are in our hollow organs, they're lining our blood vessels, they're in um, our gastrointestinal tract, they even are in our eyes to help our eyes like dilate um, to things happening in the world. Um, they're also surrounding our bladder. They push food through our digestive system and move blood through our organs. So um, I love the smooth muscles, doing a lot of work for us, not getting a lot of credit. Um, gotta love, gotta love a, a hero like that. Um, the next one we're talking about is cardiac muscles. And if you were some of those people that's like, wait a minute, I've heard the word cardiac before. Um, I'm thinking that's a heart. Yeah, you're right. Um, this is found in the heart. It is continuously contracting, right? You, you put a hand up to um, the vessels in your neck and you can feel your heartbeat, hopefully. Um, you are hearing or feeling that continuously contracting beat of your heart muscles. This is another one that you are not controlling, right? You don't have to like actively think about this. So like um, it's, it's going to happen no matter what. So happens always. It's involuntary. Um, and this is pushing blood through the heart. Um, and the big thing about these muscle groups that is <clears throat> a little more interesting or like makes them unique is you can see that they are, they've got this special shape here. <clears throat> they are rigid like this. They've also got some like spaces in between, in between there. Um, and those ridges are keeping them really tightly bonded together. This also allows that heartbeat to travel really fast through them. Um, we want the heartbeat to travel fast because uh, we don't want to get slowed up or stuck on anything. Um, these muscle cells can also handle a great deal of stress. So if you're somebody, um, maybe you're a basketball player, you're running down the court, you can feel your heart pumping. Um, it's not going to tear through any of those muscles. Um, any of those like tissues like could happen um, if you were having a really intense workout. So they these are under a lot of stress, they can handle a lot of stress. Um, we love that. The last one we are going to look at, and then we're also going to deep dive on this one. This is our skeletal muscles. This 
is our voluntary contraction. So this is when the intrusive thoughts tell you um, to throw a pencil at a peer and you do it, right? Like you, you are in control of that. Um, you are also in control of not throwing things at people. So um, don't let the intrusive thoughts win. This is all of our like major muscle groups. So when you think about like working out, especially, um, these are the muscle groups that you're thinking of. So really everything that's not your heart, that's not your hollow organs, um, or any of the ones we just mentioned. <clears throat> these also have those striations, right? You can see that they're like striped on the side. You can see that we've got like fibers in them this way as well. These are attached to our bones. And they're going to pull one attachment point to another. So if um, if my joint on my elbow here is attached with muscles, it, that's what allows me to be able to raise up my arm anytime I want. Um, so those muscles are pulling on those bones to make movement happen. All right, next thing we're going to talk about a little deeper dive on the anatomy of a muscle. So yeah, we've got muscles, but what makes them up? What do they look like? on a microscopic level. We're going to find out. Um, before we get to that, I'd like to address the tendon in the room. Um, a tendon is part of the muscular system, um, but it is a little bit different than muscle tissue. So when we talk about like muscles, we're not always including the tendon. Um, so in this image that you can see on the side here, right, it's circled, that tendon is, it's really just like this cord-like whiter part that is here. It's connective tissue. It sometimes goes past the muscle so it can attach to a bone. And those fibers often intertwine directly with the bone's periosteum. So that thing that's like on the outside of the bone. Um, so they're directly attached to that. Um, if you've had other types of tendon trouble, um, what you've probably had is tendonitis. Um, and we know a couple things about that word, right? The itis Part of tendonitis means it's like inflamed, it's infected, something's wrong. So if you're having some sort of tendonitis, your tendon has become inflamed, it is probably swollen, it is probably painful. Um, this is most common in um, tendons around your joints. So if you've been like writing a lot, your wrist might get tendonitis. Um, if you've been running a lot, you might have tendonitis in your Achilles tendon. If you're playing a lot of tennis and you're hitting that ball really hard, your tendon in your elbow might um, become inflamed and be really painful. This usually goes away with rest, um, so you don't have to don't have to worry too much. All of our muscles, and all, especially all of our skeletal muscles, are made of the same types of tissue. So we're looking at an example here of um, one type of skeletal muscle. If we're looking at the very, very first bullet point, we're seeing that fascia covers the surface of a muscle. So we're seeing this like, um, like tissue-like substance that is over all parts of the muscle. And that tissue is keeping our muscle in position. Um, it helps like keep everything together. Um, so nothing's like getting in the way of other stuff. So it's um, all together, it's nice and tidy not getting injured by something else. Um, the muscle tissue then is separated into smaller sections called fascicles. So if we're looking at an entire muscle, say this is um, one whole muscle here, maybe like it's in our thigh, right? One little section of this is a fascicle. So we're seeing this fascicle is just like one tiny little section of a muscle. So tissues separated into smaller sections. Um, and if we look, now we're looking at this fascicle, we're seeing that there's like muscle fibers within there. So if we're looking at all these tiny little dots, there's a bunch of muscle fibers in there. If we take a look just at one section of those fibers, like that's what we're seeing here. And then finally, we just wanna look at one fiber. And that's what we're seeing here, this myofibril. Um, myofibrils are making up all the muscle fibers. And you might be thinking, this is way too much. This is, um, why do we have to look at it on such a deep level? And part of that is this type of organization allows all the parts to move independently um, and do things without um, 
doing it all as a whole. It also allows um, for a lot of blood flow to happen in here. So like by separating them real nicely like this, we can get blood flow in between there, which is going to come with nutrients. We are also going to get, um, we can get nerve signals deep in there. So if we just want to move some of these um, myofibrils, then we can, right? If you had to do it all at once, um, that could sometimes be tough if you needed to do something very delicate, like pick a flower. So on this deep level, when we're looking at myofibrils, that's where muscle contraction is going to happen. So we're, we're on like this very small section of of a muscle fiber. We're seeing this myofibril here. Um, and if you look even closer, there's stuff in the myofibril. So we are seeing on the smallest, smallest scale, we are seeing these sections um, that kind of organize those myofibrils. Those are called sarcomeres. And the really important thing we are going to look at in these sarcomeres is two kinds of protein filaments. We're going to look at a thick protein filament. So if you're seeing it on here already, it's this one that's in the middle. It looks kind of thicker. And then a thinner protein filament called actin. And these two are going to play an important role in how our muscles contract. So if you see like some of those thinner ones, that's the actin. The thicker ones is the myosin. And myosin and actin are what give us muscle contraction. So the, we are going to keep those two super important because um, these two proteins, these two like fibers, are going to make us move in every every single way. I'm like, look at that strong person. They must have really good myosin and actin. They're so strong. What can't they do? Wow. So what needs to happen for this movement to be possible? Um, so the big idea here, we are having muscles contract. We are making movement happen. So what we need is a muscle fiber um, needs to interact with another muscle fiber. So we're getting cell parts interacting. Um, we're also getting maybe some molecules and chemicals coming into play. Um, and really, really, like most important thing here, we are seeing the myosin binding to the actin. When they bind together, and you can see that in here, um, right, we've got that thin one, which is actin, which is down here, binding with the thicker one, the myosin, um, in this image on the bottom. When they bind with each other, they're going to attach, and they're going to pull each other closer. So they're going to slide past each other or pull each other in that direction. This shortens our muscle fibers. It pulls all those fibers nice and close to each other. This is how all sorts of movement can happen. This is how I can wheel Mr. Arnold around in the trash. This is how you can lift up heavy things. This is how you can turn and look at somebody next to you. Um, that's how muscle contraction happens on kind of the big idea scale. If you're seeing this and you're like, okay, I got this. I'm ready for the deep dive. All right, let's do this. Um, so the more the, the deeper look at it, the more complex version of this. Um, if you have a relaxed muscle and you are trying to move it, um, you want you see a barbell on the floor and you want to you want to do a curl because you're working on your biceps. Um, what first needs to happen is an important ion that we've talked about before. We are going to have an increase of calcium come into this into this muscle fiber. When calcium increases, there is um, an area that calcium can bind to called tropomyosin. When tropomyosin and calcium come together, that allows our two besties, our Romeo and Juliet of the muscle world, to be together. So once that calcium frees up some binding sites, these two are exposed, they can, they can be together. Um, when the myosin pulls on that actin, those thin filaments, that's when we get that contraction to happen. Um, if myosin and actin are, we're done. We do not want to be, we don't want to be in um, a contraction anymore. We want to relax. That ATP, um, which is a molecule, is going to bind to the myosin head 
and they stop binding to the actin. So instead of binding to actin, myosin is now binding to ATP, which hopefully is a molecule we remember. In the ATP breakdown process, um, energy is provided. So as long as we've got ATP and we've got calcium, which is represented Ca2 plus down here, that's also calcium, that cycle can continue. So as long as you have um, energy from cellular respiration, you've got some ATP and you've got calcium, we can keep having muscle contractions. But if we are not producing ATP, think about what could happen. Well, we already know what happens. We've looked at this um, at the beginning of the year. When something is to die, it stops producing ATP. There's no cellular respiration happening, um, so we don't have ATP in the body. And then the myosin cannot detach from the actin. So instead of muscles like getting relaxed, that ATP or that myosin and actin, they're really tightly like um, bound together um, and then they're permanently contracted. This only stops when muscle proteins eventually decompose. Okay, this last section we're gonna look at is how our muscles respond to the world around us. So like some factors that might impact how our muscles move um, or how effectively they move. Some things like we might want to be thinking about is like, hey, can I use my muscle fibers more or use them less? Um, in an entire muscle, um, we can change how much we contract our fibers, which is kind of crazy to think about. So if you've ever um, received a handshake from somebody, that's like, it's like shaking hands with a fish. Um, it's not very uh, solid. Um, or you've shaken hands with somebody who's tried to crush all of the bonds in your body all the same, like it's the same muscles, um, they're just controlling them in different ways. So if you're going for that perfect handshake, um, your body needs to figure out how often are we gonna stimulate each muscle fiber, and then how many fibers take part in the overall contraction of that muscle. One other thing to think about um, when thinking about how our muscles contract and relax um, is, okay, if I'm not actively working out, are my muscles always relaxed? And the answer is no, not really. Um, the, the concept we're talking about there is muscle tone. So when a muscle appears to be at rest, its fibers are still undergoing some kind of sustained contraction. This is what keeps your mouth shut when you're listening to somebody, because if your jaw is so super relaxed, um, your mouth would fall open. This is what keeps you sitting straight up in a chair and not falling over onto the floor during class. So it's really important for like maintaining posture. Um, it's just a slight muscle contraction. So um, muscle tone, slight contraction for this one. So that is what I would make a little note of um, for muscle tone. Two other contractions we um, will sometimes talk about, especially if you're taking a weight training class, you might talk about this. Um, there are two ways that we can like put our muscles into work. Um, one of them is an isotonic contraction. So this is like really what we were talking about before. This is like the shortening of the muscle. So um, this is like really examples from this whole lecture. This would be like a bicep curl. This would be like extending your leg. This would be like raising your hand. We're lifting something up. If you're gonna lift up your anatomy textbook, um, cause you can't wait to read more about what's going on. If you're gonna um, put your teacher over your head and toss her out the window cause you're so sick and tired of um, taking notes, right? This would be an isotonic contraction. Um, the muscle is actively shortening here. A different one that we didn't really cover in the lecture is an isometric contraction. So the, the muscle is not truly shortening up um, all the way, but this would be an example of like holding a weight at your side. Your muscles are still working like against the force of gravity um, that that weight would have on you but you're not like actively shortening any of those muscle fibers. Um, this is actually a lot harder than it looks like. Um, so if you ever wanna challenge somebody to just like holding something, um, 
you'd be surprised at how difficult it can be. All right, and finally, um, we're going to look at things that might impact a muscle's ability to contract. So if you've ever been working out, maybe um, you have done a bunch of squats and now you can't do any squats anymore, you might be experiencing muscle fatigue. So um, if we think about the word fatigue, that sounds like tired. It sounds like I'm tired. My muscle's really tired. Um, so you've used a muscle to like work out for a long time. You've really worked hard. You've worked it strenuously. Um, that can lead to fatigue. Besides just overworking it or using a muscle a lot, we can get muscle fatigue from um, a depletion of ATP. So if you're not, um, if you don't have any glucose for cellular respiration, you might get muscle fatigue. Um, a drop in your pH due to like a lactic acid buildup in your body can cause muscle fatigue. You might just need some electrolytes. Um, so you might need some ions that help you do certain things. Drink a Gatorade, eat a pickle, have a banana. Um, there could be some central nervous system um, process happening or like exhaustion from your central nervous system. You could also have a disease. Um, you could have you could be poisoned. Um, you could have some bacteria going on. There's lots of different things that can lead to muscle fatigue, but that that main one is um, either you haven't eaten enough or you've overworked it. You've just worked out too much. So if you are in the gym going crazy um, and all of a sudden you can't work out anymore, you're so tired, you probably don't have lead poisoning. You just need to take a nap. Um, the another thing that can happen if your muscles get really tired um, maybe you've had a muscle cramp before um, this is a type of muscle fatigue the muscles just undergoing a sustained contraction so we are contracted we cannot relax so we are not relaxing um, if you've ever had one of these it's not fun um, it's kind of painful um, so the muscle is just getting way too stimulated um, and it's out of control a lot of times this is just can happen if you're dehydrated, um, if you've been overworking your muscles, um, low electrolytes. Anytime I've ever gotten a cramp, if I eat a pickle, that cramp disappears. So my theory is that low electrolytes are going on. So if you've, if you've got a cramp, if you've got hiccups, um, get some electrolytes in you. All right, we did it. We're at the summary. So try to answer the essential question in your summary. If you need to take some time to like think about this, try to get that summary done um, a day or two later after you've had time to think about it, connect it to our different activities. If you're ready right now, um, once again, big key parts here. We're always trying to connect structure and function to what we're doing. So what's going on with the muscular system structure? What's going on with how the system functions? Um, and how do they help us do things like create movement? How do they help our body do our processes? What role does it play in voluntary actions? And finally, how do we stay balanced? Um, if you can answer that summary, awesome. If you need to take some time, also awesome. Um, thanks for being here, eat a pickle, um, get some exercise, uh, have a nice day.